Today's topic is the primary market or the market for initial public offerings. When newly formed companies make the decision to go public, they are said to enter the primary market or the IPO market. In this market, they can issue debt securities or equity securities. Our discussion today is only focused on equities. Investors pay a price to the firm, which enables it to grow and gain market share. A few days after this allotment of shares to those primary market investors, the company is listed on a stock exchange and the shares can then be traded. This is known as the secondary market, where some primary market investors can sell their shares and others can buy them, or vice versa. This process is how private companies are transformed into publicly held companies. You can think of recent IPOs in India, like IRCTC or of Uber in the US, both which went public not too long ago. Public firms like Biocon and Infosys also started in garages and small locations, didn't they? Let's start with a quick look at history. The first IPO is often said to have been undertaken by the Dutch East India Company to raise capital, although history can actually take you back to the Roman Empire. However, in more modern times, we can start thinking of the 1920s when automobiles started to first become mass market. There were many, many companies making cars and parts for those cars. A number of those companies went public, but only a few survived. The 1960s was the time of big pharmaceutical companies. Pfizer, Merck, Abbott are a few that are still around. The 1980s brought us Apple and Microsoft. The internet craze of the late 1990s again gave rise to any number of companies which only had a dot-com attached to their names. Both globally and locally, firms go public on a regular basis. In the last decade, about 20 to 30 companies have gone public in India each year. This number was as high as 100 in 2007. So how does this process start? Formally, the business of going public commences with a document known as a prospectus. This prospectus describes how many shares are being offered by the company and reports financial information on its operations. Since shares are being offered to the public at large, such disclosure requirements are required by law and always carefully address the risks involved in making such an investment. This prospect is a must-read for serious investors. A couple are actually available on the related content section of our website on this topic. Very few of us do read the prospectus though, preferring instead to rely on the buzz generated by the way this offering is portrayed in the media. So what then is the role of an investment bank in this process? For most companies issuing shares, Discussions with investment banks are generally the first step in this process. The investment bank will assist with the prospectus, with disclosure requirements, will advise on the price at which the shares can be offered to the general public, showcase the company to potential investors, and use their distribution networks to market the offering to that public. Companies raising larger amounts of money may require a consortium of investment banks for this marketing. At times, the investment bank or banks may underwrite the new issue, which basically means that they are willing to bear the risk that the full amount of shares being offered will actually be sold. At other times, the investment bank might only commit to the issuing company on a best efforts basis, rather than taking on the risk of underwriting. The fee structure for the investment bank reflects all of these considerations I just described. Let's talk next about the issue price or offer price. Shares in the new company are offered to both institutional 
and retail investors at a specific price known as the issue or offer price. In India, until 1992, the offer price for the shares was regulated by an entity called the Controller of Capital Issues. They started with the net asset value for a young company, added a premium for companies if they could document a longer history of profitability. Subsequently, a fixed price method of offering shares was arrived at in consultation with the investment bankers. In this mechanism, although the price was fixed, the demand for the shares being offered could not be known until the offer begins to trade in the secondary market. In fact, at various points in the history of markets, IPO markets, both in India and overseas, this inability to gauge demand has resulted in wild swings in the stock price once the security starts trading in the secondary market. In the content that accompanies this video on our topic, there are several blog posts and deep dives that describe specific IPO instances. To better assess demand, as I had mentioned earlier, India now also permits a book building approach. In this approach, bids for the number of shares desired by investors at different prices, but within a preset band, are solicited from both retail and institutional investors. Bidders can even revise their bids until the time window for bidding closes. Then the issue price is determined, successful bidders get the shares and the rest get refunds. Let's talk next about how this price should be set. Of course, the company that goes public to raise capital would like the offer price to be set as high as possible. In turn, the investment bankers underwriting the issue would like the issue price to be lower, making it easier for them to sell those shares. Complicating matters still further, setting a price for a new company is easier if there are similar public companies whose securities are already trading in the secondary market. But if the company is entering a totally new line of business, then there are no peers whose current market prices can serve as a guide in setting the issue price. Some of you may recall a company known as Netscape that went public in the late 1990s in the US. It was the first internet browser. At the time, nobody even knew what a browser was. The shares of this Netscape IPO skyrocketed after it went public because people couldn't gauge its demand. Some years later, Yahoo became public, but their issue price could be set by looking at how Netscape stock performed, couldn't it? These price jumps on listing date have globally become a little less common now as the IPO market has matured with both investors and regulators becoming more savvy about pricing and about participation. A deep dive linked to this topic shows you the post-listing performance of recent unicorn IPOs in the US. These are companies whose names you will recognize even in India. Uber, Dropbox, Pinterest. Go look at that deep dive, will you? Let's lastly look at how recent Indian IPOs have actually performed. Table 1 presents a list of Indian IPOs during the 2018 and 19 period. The table tells you the date of listing, the issue price, the amount of money that was raised, as well as the performance of the stock price of the company on the listing date. Recall that the listing date is the first day the stock traded in the secondary market. Investors who subscribe to the stock at the issue price before listing always have the option to exit the position on or after listing day. As you can see from the table, listing date gains have not been very large, expect, except for a couple of companies like IRCTC and India Mart. 
shouldn't you ask next about what happens in the longer term? The first thing to recognize is that this launch of shares in the IPO equity market is usually because of an exit decision for the venture capitalist or capitalists who supported that company through their initial starting phase. Remember, this venture capitalist nurtured and advised the firm, taking substantial risks in the hope that this fledgling company would eventually become successful. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that those guys want some returns for the risk they took. Hence, this is an exit strategy for them. In India, the government also frequently attempts to shed some of its vast holdings in public sector companies. In recent years, particularly for potentially successful companies, there have been partial exits by early venture capitalists and entries by later ones, both happening well before the company actually went public. Despite this attention paid to the issue price, which we have also done so far, the key thing that should matter is how the company performs in the longer term. We know the successful ones, some are household names. They have made many investors rich beyond their wildest dreams. But there are many that are unsuccessful too. Refer back to table one again. The last column in it tells you the performance of the stock from listing date until about November 2019, which is when I'm recording this video. The story is clearly a little different here. Some companies have good gains post-listing, others have bad losses, probably having to do with how well the company executed on its future plans since that listing date. So all I can tell you is what I always say at the conclusion of every one of these videos, do your homework before you get into such investments in initial public offerings. Thank you. Come back and look at more of our content on the Pi website.